the government suffers its first Commons defeat since the election. Despite John Major's appeal to the Maastricht rebels, 26 Tories voted with Labour. Good evening. Despite doing everything bar stand on its head to persuade Tory rebels to fall into line, the government was this evening defeated in a Commons vote on an amendment to the Maastricht Bill. The vote means yet further delay to the treaty's ratification, but more significantly, the Tory rebellion is a kick in the teeth for Mr Major. The Foreign Secretary tells us the rebels are making a serious mistake, and members of the alliance that voted together to defeat the government, Labour's George Robertson, Liberal Democrat President Charles Kennedy, and leading Euro-rebel Bill Cash explain what they want to see happen next. Since the 1970s, thousands of British women have had silicon implants in their breasts for cosmetic or surgical reasons. Sue Bishop reports on new evidence that questions the implant's safety. I'm here in America, where women are winning millions of dollars in the law courts because of new evidence suggesting silicon breast implants were inadequately tested and are hazardous to health. As the research continues, cosmetic implants have been banned here and elsewhere, but they're still available on demand in Britain. Some three hours ago in the House of Commons, the government lost a vote on an amendment to the bill whose progress through Parliament is now becoming a painful marathon, the Maastricht Bill. The amendment itself is not likely to affect the ratification of the treaty, but it has provided another focus for the opposition to the government, whether from Labour or the Liberal Democrats, or even from those who oppose Maastricht on the government's own benches. The final tally was 292 votes for the government, with loyal Tories joined by the Scottish and Welsh nationalists, plus a Liberal and a Unionist, and 314 against, including 26 rebel Conservatives, 18 Liberal Democrats and 6 Unionists. Significantly, another 22 Conservatives failed to vote at all, including leading backbenchers Kenneth Baker and David Howell. As James Cox now reports, the outcome of this vote threatens to split wide open the cracks that Maastricht has caused in the Conservative Party. The government finally decided to confront its rebels and urge them to do their worst. The rebels did. The eyes to the right, 314. The nose to the left, 292. Yeah! The government suffered the psychological blow of losing by 22 votes. In fact, the vote on an obscure and largely technical Labour amendment doesn't make a huge difference to the Maastricht Treaty. Amendment 28 says that in the implementation of the Committee of the Regions, the 24 members and 24 alternate members of that committee shall be drawn from elected local government representatives. The government wanted them to be appointed. Giving elected people an important, a significant voice in the deliberations of the European community is an important step forward. I don't really understand why the government has opposed it, since it does them no particular damage. What we're saying to the government is there's more of this in store unless they look for a solution, and there is a solution. All we want is a referendum to let the people decide if the government agreed to a referendum, the rebellion is over, they can get the bill through very quickly indeed, and there'll be no more trouble. It was the symbolic significance of a potential defeat that sent government managers running to Downing Street this morning in frantic efforts to find a way out. There were rumours of deals with Labour, the Lib Dems, the Ulster Unionists or Scott Nats. If I can have your indulgence. In the House, the Minister for Europe said the substance of the amendment was of little concern. What worried the government was that it was a naked attempt to delay ratification. Given that we seek to reject the amendment in order to prevent artificial delay of the bill, would it, would, it, would it be possible before the division is taken for a further debate to take place on that matter? No. So the vote went ahead with Tory rebels unabashed at defeating the government. My own opposition to this treaty has been known for a very long time. I remember telling the Chief Whip uh, years ago that wild horses wouldn't drag me into the lobbies for any more of, of this European nonsense. Um, I've told all my constituents, and they well understand, that I am absolutely obdurate in my opposition to this treaty on European Union. But a former Chief Whip says he's appalled by the disarray in which the rebels are throwing their own party and government. I've never known anything like it before in 19 years in the House of Commons, nor indeed in the one year when I was Chief Whip. Then we had plenty of other difficulties about the community charge or passports for Hong Kong citizens. People told us they were going to vote us against us on principle, but they never actually stopped us running the business the way we wanted to do. And that, of course, is government's natural prerogative. 
It's the opposition delays, but government decides how long the debate will go on for. At the moment, government is unable to decide because of the action of our 30 or 40 euro haters, and that is very unusual and I think makes it very difficult for the whips. It all comes down to a question of what MPs are elected to support, the government or their own principles. Some of the most prominent rebels say that last April they made it perfectly clear to their electors where they stood. I don't think it would be a matter on which the government would be brought down, but I should certainly, um, uh, I mean obviously I'd take into account the considerations at each time, but, but it would be my general uh, feeling that the transference of power to Europe was so important a matter as to require a vote against any organisation and any party that wished to transfer that power. The rebels claim they are more representative of feeling in the country than the government is. But constituency officials, stern guardians of party orthodoxy, are getting increasingly perturbed by the internal divisions. At a meeting in London today of constituency chairmen, we could find none who publicly opposed the treaty, and in some seats there is an open rift between party and member. I'm absolutely fed up with it. 30 MPs are holding the government to ransom, and it's about time that the government were allowed to get on with their own business and pass legislation to put young thugs behind bars rather than all this messing around on the Maastricht Bill. We're in Europe and there's nowhere else for us to go. They were elected on the basis of the Maastricht Treaty and they should be allowed to govern. I think the time has gone when constituency chairmen have to look at their members of parliament and if they are among this gang, they have to say, do you really want to be our Conservative candidate at the next election? We aren't at all certain that you're going the right way about it. Francis Pym, now Lord Pym, once famously said, and was famously slapped down by Mrs Thatcher for saying, that small majorities can keep rebels in line. That's true when the issues are relatively uncontroversial. But great ideological physios transcend such rules. Ted Heath's battles against the Powerlites, and Harold Wilson's against Labour's left-wingers, left their reputations tarnished and their administrations undermined. Unless he can reassert control over his party, Mr Major might suffer the same fate. But tonight, sources close to Downing Street were insisting the government would continue to seek to win by persuasion and patience. Mr Major, it seems, is still anxious not to alienate the Thatcherites if he can possibly avoid it. Well, shortly after tonight's division, I spoke to the Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurt, and I began by asking him if he was surprised by the number of Conservative MPs who'd voted against the government. There obviously were quite a few Tories who voted for a Labour amendment, which I think is an odd thing to do. In a way, even odder is the attitude of people like the Liberals who've been urging us to get on with this, to get on with the bill, uh, but today have simply voted for delay for delay's sake. The only substantial importance of this vote is that it imposes delay. Let's talk a little about your own party management, however. I mean, the weekend you pulled out all the stops urging the rebels to vote for the government. Doesn't the fact that you failed in that effort show that the authority of John Major as Prime Minister is undermined? No, it shows that uh, our rebels are making a serious mistake. Uh, instead of uh, working for the unity of the party, which I think we can put together once Maastricht is ratified, they're picking away and imposing delay on a parliamentary process which for heaven's sake is going to take long enough anyway. We've, we've done a hundred hours on the details of this bill. We've got a long way to go, quite rightly. There are many matters still to be discussed. What has happened today, and really the only result of today, hasn't in any way altered our ability to ratify the treaty. It hasn't touched the treaty. It has simply imposed a delay. I cannot see the point of that. There's a great deal else that we ought to be getting on with. Mr. Hurd, what do you believe should now happen to those rebellious MPs within your own party? Should, for example, as Tim Renton indicated to Newsnight earlier, should their constituency chairman now perhaps threaten them with deselection? No, well, that's, no, that's nothing to, to do with me. Every member of parliament has his own relationship with his own constituency. Uh, we all, or not, not everybody, but most, uh, almost all conservative members of parliament, uh, were elected on the basis of a manifesto which included the ratification of Maastricht. Um, the ratification of Maastricht has had very big parliamentary majorities every time it's been put to the test. Uh, I hope that those who up to now have voted uh, against uh, the bill and now have simply voted for delay will realize that there are, you know, there are better things to be doing, better things to be getting on with, that we are going to get the bill through, we are going to ratify the treaty, that's not really in question anymore, 
The question is simply how much time it's going to take. I don't see any advantage in perverse delay. But the very fact that they were voting on what you say is a relatively minor point surely is some indication of the depth of feeling that persists within the party. Oh, there's no doubt about the depth of feeling. There's no doubt about the depth of feeling. Uh, and we have to continue to argue the case. And the huge majority of the parliamentary party, a big majority in the House of Commons, uh, believes that we should ratify the treaty. The treaty provides the agreed basis for our community to function. It's not a blueprint for a superstate. In fact, it's perfectly clear to me from the negotiations for the treaty, where we rejected a blueprint for a superstate, uh, and from everything that's happened since then, there's not going to be a European superstate. Uh, we have to persuade uh, our rebels of that. We haven't yet managed to do so. But isn't there a danger that, that by continuing to push on with the bill, despite these very deeply held objections within the party, you risk causing the kind of serious splits that happened with the Heath government in the 1970s when they battled against the Powellites? Well, if we abandoned the bill, the split would be very much greater and the damage to our country, our influence abroad, our chances of economic recovery would be very substantial. So it's clearly much better to go on, which is what we intend to do. Mr. Hurd, the argument in favour of a referendum seems to be gaining momentum. Now, at the weekend, the historian of the party, Lord Blake, said that he felt this would settle it once and for all. Don't you think that the time has now come for that? But uh, settle it once for all? People are still arguing about our membership of the community. People look like Nigel Spearing, like Tony Benn in the House of Commons. You know, the referendum of 75 didn't settle that for them. No, a referendum is a contradiction in a parliamentary democracy. We are elected to do the job. And tonight, the House of Commons took a decision which imposed a delay. A pity, but it did that. That is Parliament's job. Now, that's why Margaret Thatcher and the rest of us voted against having a referendum in 1975. We thought it was a cop-out of Harold Wilson's. It's uh, it designed to reduce the splits in the Labour Party. So we all went into the lobbies against having a referendum. We believe in a parliamentary democracy. And then if members of the public, if the public don't like the way their members of parliament uh, do their stuff, uh, then they choose somebody else. The Foreign Secretary speaking earlier. Well, Newsnight's James Cox is down at Westminster now. And uh, James, the, the Foreign Secretary was suggesting there that in fact it makes little practical difference. Um, what are the practical implications of this evening's vote? Well, it will impose delay, that is clear, because they now have to have the report stage uh, if the uh, bill had gone through unamended in the committee, then they wouldn't have had to have that. As it is, it's all slightly ludicrous because the committee is, of course, a committee of the whole House. But formally, the committee has to report to the whole House that it is deliberated and uh, agreed uh, and, and, and various uh, changes have been put through and they will have to be debated further. Uh, I think if you talk to Tory grandees, uh, you get two different views. Uh, some of the party are very angry indeed. Um, not perhaps grandees, but people as disparate as Terry Dix and Jerry Hayes are extremely angry at the rebels. But others, like the Foreign Secretary, are more resigned. One very senior government source I was talking to tonight said he always expected that they would suffer a defeat at some stage, given the opposition against them, that they would have to have a report stage. Well, it's happened, he said. We've been lucky it hasn't happened up until now, but it has happened. It'll put a few more weeks on it. The job now is to continue patiently to plod away, and in, in the meantime, and the most important thing he said is to reassure our European partners that this has not derailed the system, this is a hiccup, not as it were a choking fit. But as if, as you indicate, that um, some party loyalists are indeed spitting about the result, um, what kind of sanctions do you think they might impose against the U Euro rebels, if any? Well, I, I think this is a, a very difficult point, again, as, as, as Douglas Hurd was pointing out there. Um, some of them, like uh, Tim Renton in, in that little piece I had earlier, do think that perhaps the, the constituency chairman should, should crack the whip. But it's very much more difficult to do that in the Tory party than, for example, in the Labour party. One old parliamentary hand I was talking to this evening, not incidentally at all, said he thought the trouble had been that um, John Major and Michael Heseltine and Ken Clark and uh, Douglas Hurd at, at Harrogate at the end of last week all, s all appealed for unity and said we must all stick together with a majority of only 20. He said that was the wrong way to do it. They should have let the rebels have their say, let them have their, their victory or defeat uh, tonight and then said, right, well, you've done that, you've delayed things, you've made us look silly, now's the time to fall into line. Mind you, I'm not sure that that would have worked either because the rebels have now got the bit between their teeth. 
but I think the government is determined that it doesn't regard this as a, it's a, as a setback but not a disaster it intends to plug away it will go on through April through May if necessary into June it is determined to get this treaty ratified and uh, it will see off the rebels if not with the big stick then with the soft stick James James Cox thanks very much indeed well, joining us now in the studio are three key figures who uh, voted against the government this evening, and they are George Robinson, for who is Labour's spokesman on Europe, Charles Kennedy, Liberal Democrats' president, and uh, Bill Cash, the ringleader, as it were, of the Euro rebels. Bill Cash, do you accept that this whole Maastricht question is poisoning the very heart of the Conservative Party? No, I don't. It's about a democratic principle, and that's what we're fighting for. And that is that we should, within the European community, be able to govern ourselves. The fact is that there have been changes in the European community, but this particular amendment was about whether or not the Council of Ministers should appoint the people who would be in the Committee of the Regions, or whether in fact they should be elected representatives. That is a democratic question. But and I had no difficulty whatever in saying that I think they should be elected. Otherwise it would just be a gravy train, patronage and all the rest. But your tactics have made the government look like a complete shambles, particularly after the direct appeal made to you this weekend by the Prime Minister. Well, uh, the fact is that it is an issue of principle. It's a matter of national interest and national conscience. And I have absolutely no doubt whatever that we have massive support in the country for what we're doing because we are bringing out the truth about this Maastricht Treaty. There was no white paper, no free vote, and they won't even allow a free vote on a referendum clause which would allow the members of Parliament to be able to allow their constituents to make their own choice. It really is quite an incredible state of affairs. But you cannot possibly, as Douglas Heard pointed out, scupper the treaty. You will simply go on, will you, squabbling about small points? Oh yes, we can scupper the treaty, and we have every intention of doing so. And the reason for doing that is because it is authoritarian and undemocratic. After all, if unelected bankers unaccountable bankers are to run the monetary affairs for the whole of Europe, that is absolutely striking at the heart of democracy for Europe as a whole. And if it collapses and the whole thing disintegrates, there'll be absolute chaos. And this idea that somehow or other Maastricht is good for the economy is complete junk. The reality is that the collapse of the ERM proves our point. If ERM collapse, so will EMU. All right, let me bring in George Robertson for Labour here. Now, Bill Cash is saying that he st still thinks that there is a very real prospect of scuffling the treaty. Would you be in favour of that? No, we're not. Uh, we'd like to see the government wrecked, but we don't want to see the Maastricht Treaty wrecked, and we've no intention of doing that. What the, this evening's events were about was about a serious issue of democratic principle. I agree for once with Bill Cash on this. Uh, uh, here was a government saying that ministerial placemen should uh, be put onto this Committee of the Regions, and Parliament was quite reasonably saying, and we've, this amendment's been down for nine months, saying that the, the membership should be made up of people who have got some democratic mandate and that elected councillors should make it up. Now that seems to me impeccably reasonable. It's a serious point. It's not trivial. Nothing to do with delay. We've no interest in further delaying uh, this bill or the treaty itself. The government has been humiliated and it was their own fault. Charles Kennedy, you're not going to talk about principle as well, are you? Because last November you actually voted to help the government through with that yeah, stage. And to get on with the Maastricht business, yeah. Right, and, and let's, today nail this, let's nail this nonsense that the Foreign Secretary came out with, delay, delay, delay. That's not what it was about at all. You've got all party agreement here in this sense. It was about democracy, this particular yeah. amendment right. to the bill. And some of us have made quite clear, we take Labour and Liberal Democrats, we both said we support Maastricht, but we don't think we should be opting out of the social chapter. Now, we'll have a vote on that, which may well also, I think, see a government defeat. The fact of the matter is, this was about democracy, not about delay, and we're not going to take lectures, frankly, from John Major and Douglas Hurd about delay, because they had to be dragged kicking and screaming. Uh, actually to bring forward the Maastricht legislation to begin with. But do you believe, as uh, Bill Cash has said, that the treaty has been significantly breached by this amendment? No, I, I, I don't feel that as such. No, I mean, all this is doing, as Bill pointed out, is it's taking away the power of patronage from the executive to put whoever shall represent Britain in the Committee of the Regions, and it's ensuring those people have got some kind of democratic mandate. I hope the Conservative Party goes further we start seeing this in health authorities Frozen. as well. Yeah. Well, could, 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 I just, could I just make a point here, which is, of course, the opportunity <coughs> is now offered, as with the Labour Amendment 27 on the social chapter, to marry up the amendment that's just been made 
with the bill itself and put it into domestic law. Now, the test that I would like to offer uh, my, uh, the two people on the panel here is whether they would be prepared to vote for that in the bill, because then that would bind the government and that would wreck the treaty. And I'd like to know whether they're prepared to do that. Because if they've well, done this, they not, should do the other. We're not out to wreck the treaty. We want the social chapter. And we will vote for amendments that Word. force the government to accept the social chapter, just as the other 11 governments in the community all have accepted and all think is essential. Now that doesn't mean that we've got to go along with Bill Cash's ultimate objective which is the total wreckage. If the government is silly enough and uh, is, is, is tactically stupid enough to say that they will not do anything about the social chapter then they will be in trouble. But it will be trouble of their own making not of ours. But what do you think Charles Kennedy will be the effect on our European partners of seeing a vote like this? I mean we're already getting some indications out of Brussels this evening but you know it looks like a shambles to them. But they well I think if you talk to most of the people in the Commission, most of the other 11 member states during the period of John Major's presidency, they felt it was all a bit of a shambles and a disappointment and a letdown. There was a, a policy vacuum at the heart of Europe. And I think, therefore, they will not be surprised that the British government is continuing to display that lack of leadership. This is the big criticism of John Major. He has never gone out and sold this treaty positively. He's tried to look over his shoulder and sell it to his own backbenches on the basis that it doesn't do this, we stopped it doing that, we're opting out of the following. If I want to sell you something, persuade you of something, I say, look, this is good for the following reasons. I don't say, take it off my hands or accept it because it um, doesn't do all, all these things that you're worried why, why about. Why not have a white paper? Why not have a white paper? You have always been against the idea of a referendum. Now we're seeing more and more noise made about the possibility of a referendum. We even saw Lord Blake, his story in the party, talking about it, of the Conservative Party, talking about it at the weekend. Are you still against it? Well, I don't think the fact that Lord Blake writes one article in a newspaper sig you know, significantly shows that there's a huge tidal wave of opinion in the country. 